Good morning. Good morning. Scripture reading is found in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 3, starting in verse 13. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's one underneath your seat if you want to follow along in there. And if you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that home as a gift to you. Again, Mark 3, 13 through 35. And Jesus went up to the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for for they were saying, he's out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against him and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is God's word. Amen. We're going to talk quite a bit this morning about family and home, especially the one you grew up in. Uh, And we do that because Jesus' biographer here, Mark, shares insight into both Jesus' family of origin and his spiritual family in the passage we just read, right? But the real point of these passages is that Jesus himself embodies an ideal home. Hence the title of the message you see this morning behind me on the screen, Jesus Alone, My Home. And if that concept of God in the flesh, his home, God as home, seems a little out there, foreign to our ears, it wouldn't have to every first century Jew listening to Jesus. And their sung prayers, for example, uh, in their sung prayer book, they would have sung or prayed from Psalm 90, verse 1, O Lord, throughout all generations, you have been my home. And their law, recited on Saturdays, the local synagogue, they'd hear Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, the eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are everlasting arms. In that first line, it's a description of God as our home, our dwelling place, and then God's law pictures underneath the roof of the home an everlasting sea of arms ready to embrace any and all who would make their dwelling in him. It's a beautiful picture of coming into a home with with arms everywhere, embracing those who put their dwelling place in God. All of this would sound beautiful, but how would someone actually experience God as their home? Well, along comes Jesus, right, to embody what their prayers and their law only described. And we see Jesus embody home in our passage, all of which can be summarized as follows. This is our message in a nutshell this morning. If you remember nothing else, remember this. Jesus is my ideal home. Jesus is my home. 
Jesus is my home. And I was trying to think of a way for you guys to remember this this week, to really capture your attention and remember it throughout the week that Jesus is my home. So I tried to find a t-shirt that said, Jesus is my home. All right? And, and I got close. All right? I got close. Instead, what I ended up with was pretty close, which is Jesus is my homie. Jesus is my homie. So I'm going to be wearing this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Jesus is my homie. Now, <laughs> and for some of you guys, they oh, I can't believe Ryan's doing it. Well, look, I looked up uh, this term, homie, uh, and, and, and its origin, it was slang. The slang term homie originated from this idea of someone who represented comfort, who represented the familiarity of home, someone you could be with, and they made you feel like you were at home. So I thought, what could be better than having a T-shirt Jesus is my homie. So I'm wearing it this morning, and uh, you'll see it again later from our worship leader also. <laughs> my hope this morning is that you will see Jesus display supreme love for his followers. And not only supreme love, but supreme value for his followers in such a compelling way that you too will want to make Jesus your ideal home. You're going to say, I, that is what I've been looking for. That is what I've been longing for embodied in him. But before we start, we got to first acknowledge the ugly side of home and family, because it's there. I was chatting this week to an uh, older and now retired pastor, and he said, if, if we read every part of the Bible as a message from a loving father, it would change not only our, our perspective of God, but it would change our lives. And he went on to say, the problem is very few in your generation, Ryan, or, or younger generations have actually had a very positive experience of their father. And, you know, I had to agree. And he continued on. He said, he said, so what I try to do with my congregation is embody a father, to be a father to every single one of them. And I said, brother, man, that sounds great. And what a great example to follow. But I'm in my 40s. Half of my congregation could be my mother <laughs> or my father. The other half would entail me having had them in my teens. So I said, I guess I, I could be a teenage dad to them, <laughs> right? That, that, could, that could be that way. But we get his point, right? Many of us have had, at best, mixed experiences with our fathers, our mothers, our families. And that, that affects absolutely affects how we perceive our Heavenly Father and how we perceive the so-called church family we're a part of. It colors it, right? And certainly Jesus had this experience as well. Jesus' experience, his experience with his family of origin was mixed also, as we see in our passage this morning, right? First, families can misplace expectations on us. They can misplace expectations. Verses 20 and 21, Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again, so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. Now, home for Jesus is likely Peter's house in Capernaum, as we saw in the first chapter of Mark. But here, in our passage, home comes to Jesus. Home comes to Jesus. His family had heard of the miracles, right? The crowds, the friction that started to take place between Jesus and the religious leaders. So they come to him and try to seize him. A word, by the way, regularly used by Mark in the sense of restricting one's freedom. They want to restrict Jesus' freedom, and they say he's lost his mind. Today, we would, we would, we would come to someone, we would say, hey, you're just not yourself, Right? You're just not yourself. And it's really not that difficult to appreciate where his family of origin is coming from. Jesus, of course, went from growing up with them as a son, a brother, a fellow worker in the shop, to preaching the good news as a liberator, healing people, drawing crowds, opposing religious leaders, and then creating a new kind of family. On top of that, and, and you could hear them thinking to themselves and saying to him, it's too much, Jesus. This is too much. You weren't like this. 
when we slept together on the roof as kids, when we picked dates or figs together in the field, when we ate mom's overcooked food together, I'm more comfortable treating you like you were when you were a kid. That's how I'm comfortable with you, Jesus. How many of us have heard or experienced something like this when we return home as adults? Right? Or we go to be with our, our mom and dad as adults, right? Now listen, there's so much I appreciate and love about my family of origin. I mean, and genuinely, I, I love them and some of my closest friends. The values, hard work, grit, uh, expressing affection. My family was really great about that. Uh, humor, not taking yourself too seriously, and a love for God. A lot of the tone of our family, especially uh, when my mom got sick and and then passed away um, after that time, a lot of the tone for my family is set by my father, who was a wonderful guy. And I got to be careful here because some of the members of my family listen to our podcast and will listen to this, including my father. And and I know they're secure in, 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 in our mutual love and appreciation for each other. But I'll just say this because we're talking about family this morning. I got to say it. My father also set a pace for a love, maybe an over-love, for higher education. Uh, That you make your friends in college, and you join a fraternity and sorority, and you're allowed to party in those four years, but no other time. He also set the pace for an absurd loyalty to the hotel chain Marriott. Uh, he, he, He set the pace for finding cheap deals all year long so we could go skiing once per year. Uh, talking too much at times about body image in our family, and when going on vacation, uh, ogling the homes of the filthy rich and evaluating them, sometimes for hours, these homes. I remember we used to go on these bike rides at the beach and along the road, we would judge these crazy expensive homes, and we'd share how great they would be to own for ourselves and what we would do with them, and then describe our own remodeling that we're doing, but not me because I'm in my 20s and I'm only renting and I couldn't stand this ritual, right? It, it just, as we did this, and we sometimes do it three times during the vacation hours, I'd be like, man, it's just, it's just overwhelming, materialistic. And so many years ago, in my 20s, I remember I expressed this. I finally expressed this to my families. You know, I really don't enjoy this, only to be met with, oh, Ryan, always having to be different. <laughs> you know, youngest kid. And I heard that enough times to the point where I remember telling Katie, Maybe I am just different, right? People actually change. Jesus experiences in the flesh what so many of us have, a family grappling with an adult member who's actually evolved, <laughs> not the same when they were, as they were when they were a kid. And when do we often experience this, or sorry, what do we often experience from our family When this happens, they try to pin us down to who they remember us to be, who who they expect us to be. And they try to pigeonhole us there. When we're told in verse 32 that his mother and his brothers are, quote, outside seeking you, that word translated seeking, in English, the word translated seeking is used 10 times in Mark's gospel, and every time it's an attempt to pin Jesus down and control him with their expectations of him. This is who you are, Jesus. This is who we remember you to be. Your family, your family, like mine, may be great, but they never fully love and value you for exactly who you are in the present. They can't. Some of you, though, grew up in homes and families that were more than just flawed. They were downright hostile. And families can also be cruel. Not just flawed, but cruel. That's the second thing we see here in our passage this morning. The the scribes. The scribes are teachers of the Torah. The Torah, the law. The Old Testament law. And as such, they were honored with the title of rabbi. Jesus, too, was honored by the same title. You might remember Rabboni, Mary calls him in Aramaic. And so there should be this commonality between the scribes and Jesus. It was the scribes, they were the ones who were astonished at Jesus' love for and knowledge of the law in the Old Testament when he was just 12 years old. 
They saw it, and they appreciated it, and they were astonished by it. My point is, the scribes should be the most natural allies of Jesus. The most likely to be a family to Jesus when his family just couldn't understand where he was coming from. They would understand. Do you ever have that thankfully occasional, not too often experience? When you intend to do something selfless and good, but after doing it, someone accuses you of it being selfish and bad, right? It's, it's perhaps the worst experience. I never get more distressed and defensive when this happens, and it's usually because of a misunderstanding, right? Oh, I intended to pick up the car from, from the shop, so you didn't have to, not because I got the car to use it for myself. I was trying to do you a favor, but you see it as selfish, and it's a terrible feeling, right? Because you meant good by it. Well, here, Jesus is accused by the scribes of intending to, to decide with Satan. When, when he was doing something supremely good, they say, no, 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 it's evil. It's Satan. He was healing the sick. He was helping the men mentally troubled. He was uh, relieving the spiritually disturbed. He was accused of the very opposite that he intended, right? But this time, in this instance, it's no misunderstanding. It's just downright cruel what they are accusing him of. The scribes are saying that Jesus is making his home with evil. It's one thing to not believe who Jesus says he is, to judge him as not worthy of following. I mean, that happens all the time, right? That's happened for millennia. Many don't. It's quite another to aggressively call evil what is, in fact, loving Jesus is trying to bind the author of evil, Satan, the so-called strong man in this passage. He's trying to bind him and undo all the work of evil on this earth. That's what, he's been, that's what he was sent to do. To say that Jesus is doing evil to people isn't simply unbelief. It's an intentional perversion of his very character and his mission here on earth aggressively saying Jesus makes his home with the author of all evil and then calling good evil. As Jesus says in verses 28 through 30, it's a step too far. It is too far. And by the way, if you ever worry, you've ever committed this particular sin called blasphemy of the Spirit, if you ever worry you've committed that sin, you haven't. Because the very fact that you worry at all how Jesus might regard you means you don't think of him as evil, like the scribes do in this passage. And that was Jesus' whole point. Not that you don't believe in me, not that you don't want to follow me, but you're ascribing to me evil in the good I'm doing that way as well. So if you ever worry about that, you don't have to, because if you worry, the fact that you worry at all means you don't regard Jesus as evil. Some of you grew up in homes that weren't just flawed. They were cruel. In that, in that at-home atmosphere, what was good and what was true was perverted and twisted into something much worse. I know one adult son whose sister, when they were kids, would sinner, sinisterly blame every mishap, everything that she did on him. And her father believed her every time, such that he always punished the son without any question. And I hate that this happened to, to a young boy over and over again. And hearing this heartache, you know, it's telling that Jesus, whose forgiveness, by the way, is renowned, says here, you've gone too far. You've gone too far. There is a line, and you've crossed it. I want you to hear that if this morning I'm describing your family of origin. You don't have to go back. It's not on you to keep trying over and over again to make it right in the midst of twisted cruelty. You don't have to. Sometimes it is too far, as Jesus himself shows here. And thankfully, Jesus provides a way out. He provides all of us with a better alternative because Jesus embodies my true home. Jesus embodies my true home. My mother <clears throat> always loved these Hallmark holiday movies, these Hallmark Channel holiday movies. And as she got sicker, 
with Parkinson's. It was a way for my, my father. He would patiently spend time with her, loving her. It was a beautiful thing to watch for my dad and one of the things I've learned from him. My, my youngest, Gage, and one of my nephews as well, Andy, would also sit with her and, and watch these movies with her as well. And it was so sweet to watch. Have any of you ever seen these Hallmark holiday movies? Give me an idea. Okay, raise your hand. All right. So you know that they all pretty much have the same plot, right? They're, they're, it's pretty much the same plot. The plot is this. Some overworked professional female, all right? She's, she's a businesswoman. She's a professional female. She, uh, she's with someone she doesn't really love, but she wants to be with someone. So the, the, the plot now go you know, one of two ways. It's either a colleague on a holiday project she's also working on, who she's always considered a friend, this colleague, or some salt-of-the-earth bloke from her childhood home, right, who's not the same professional she is. He's a humble carpenter or whatever, okay. They stumble into the picture, and that man, he perfectly loves her. And he perfectly values her unique gifts and contributions to the world. And at the last minute, she chooses him. She chooses him, and they make their home together at some Christmas tree lighting or carving, you know, pumpkin carving ceremony, whatever holiday it might be, right? You get it. Yeah, you get it, Joel. You understand. You've seen that. Yeah. <laughs> But the issue is, as we've seen this morning with Jesus' family and the people who should be Jesus' family, that person does not exist in real life. That sense of home isn't anyone's experience in reality. In reality, our experience is somewhere between good but flawed with misplaced expectations or a family that's devolved into total cruelty. Friends, only Jesus can fulfill, well, first of all, only Jesus can fulfill the true Hallmark movie, right? But also, only he can fulfill your journey to find a true home, a true home. I want us to notice how Jesus both supremely loves and supremely values those who choose to follow him. Verse 14, and he appointed the 12 whom he also named apostles. By the way, I want to stop here. Did you notice how he gave them nicknames, like a true family? That's, it's a beautiful thing. But he appointed the 12. We also named apostles so that they might be with him and might send them out to preach. Now, the word translated appointed here in English is the same word used in the Greek version of Genesis 1, chapter 1. God created the heavens and the earth in the same way Jesus created this new family. It wasn't just appointed. He created this new family out of nothing, just like God created the heavens and the earth. And notice, notice again, bonus here, he created a family to be with him. Just bask in that for a moment. It's a detail you might just gloss over. He created this new family just to be with him. This, he created a new family simply to be with you. He loves you so much, he just wants you by his side to be with him. Second, he also did it because he valued each person's contribution, each person's gifting. He didn't just love them. He sent them out to preach. He sent them out to participate in building the kingdom of God with him because they had gifts, because they had talents, because they have something to give, and he calls it out in them. Jesus supremely loves and values those who make their home in him. And that values part is really important to understanding the end of today's passage, verses 32 through 35. Read that with me again, if you would. And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. Whenever I've read this passage previously, i got to tell you, uh, I missed a couple details. First of all, the crowd was sitting with him. Again, Jesus wanted them by his side. He loved them. But a second detail is this. Whoever does the will of God, he is my family. I've read this in the past, and I've often been troubled by it. I thought, oh, it sounds like legalism. Jesus values me because of what I can do for him. If I do enough for him, then he'll love me. But that's not really what's going on here. Think about it. When you're with family, 
You not only want to be unconditionally loved by them, right? You want to be valued. You want, you want your father, you want your mom, you want your siblings to acknowledge your contribution to the family, that you bring something to the table, right? Something that without you would be missing in the family. We all sense this, right? In some ways, we want that more than to be loved. We want to be valued. Think about this for those who are around Jesus on this day. For all those whose family never recognized their value, Jesus calls it out in them. He says, like me, these around me do my Father's will. They are my brother. They are my sister. Value is so important. You know, from the from the 1960s to 1980s, the good news about Jesus exploded in the country of South Korea. Christians in that country went from nearly 0% to now 30% today. 30% of the country claimed to love and follow Jesus. And because Christianity is fairly new there, there's still a fiery zeal to reach others for Jesus in that nation, including the 33,000 North Korean defectors to South Korea. Those who said they don't want part of that oppressive regime, they, they defected to South Korea. 33,000. I was reading an article this week in Christianity Today about how the South Korean church is trying to reach their new, newer neighbors with the good news about Jesus. Because there's so many of them there. And so many have, exp have experienced this cruel regime and leaving their families in many cases. And many tactics to reach them with the good news have failed. Uh, Eric Foley, the CEO of Voice of the Martyrs Korea, feels though that their organization in partnership with some churches in South Korea have found, have tapped into a unique solution. So in the West, it's considered rude to show up to someone's home unannounced, right? I hope we all acknowledge that as rude, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, <laughs> nod your head. Um, in the West, it's considered that way, right? But among Koreans, it's considered a high compliment to show up to, 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 to my home unannounced. By showing up, you are saying that the host is regarded as so hospitable that you didn't even get, need to give them any notice. That's how highly you regard them in their hospitality. So what Foley and others have done, it's really interesting, they've started to go to these defectors' homes during the Christmas season, and by showing up unannounced, the more dominant culture is placing themselves in a position of humility and dependence. And they're exalting the value of their North Korean hosts. And it's no surprise, it's working. It's working to build relationships. Why do you think that is? Because they're not only showing love, they're showing value. I value your contribution. I value your hospitality. I value what you bring to the table. That's why we initiated the giving tree for kids impacted by foster care as our major gift drive this, this Christmas season. It's not just about giving the gifts, but through Santa's secret shop, it's creating this atmosphere where the foster parent, the social worker, the group home leader gets to go to this shop, choose the gift, have it wrapped, Right on that, that to from tag, from, right from them. It's from me, not from us, from them. And what does that do? They feel a sense of dignity. They feel a sense of value that they have contributed to their foster child's life if they didn't have a gift. Right? Again, you're adding value. On, on Thanksgiving evening at our nomadic shelter, I got a chance to sit down and eat dinner with Mike. Now, I don't know what you think of me, and, and in case it's, you think too highly of me, I get really nervous in initiating a conversation with a homeless person, because I'm, I'm not homeless, and I'm always worried that I'm gonna, I might say something condescending, uh, rude, or I, I just hurt, be hurtful in some way that I don't intend to be, but I might be. I get nervous about it, but Mike was so easy to talk with, um, and because my youngest son, Gage, is really interested in film, and it's kind of a film connoisseur, we got into the subject of movies. And Mike told me how this was once a passion of his and that throughout his lifetime, he's owned 30 different cameras. And he worked uh, in places like a Richmond, Virginia, where I once lived. And so I asked him, like, oh, what's, what's a famous movie I might know from, but it was filmed in Richmond, Virginia. Well, he got to be a featured extra in, in Richmond where they filmed the movie Lincoln, starring Daniel Day-Lewis. 
Well, so Mike went on to give me advice about how uh, uh, Gage could, could get started if he wanted to get involved in the film industry someday. And I walked away so blessed by that conversation for many reasons, but one of which is that Mike made a contribution to my life and to my family's life by giving me this advice. My only regret, I didn't tell him. I didn't express it to him. I should have said, Mike, thank you, man. You really helped us in a huge way. You contributed to my family in a big way. I should have communicated value, and I didn't. But I'm not going to forget next time. And hopefully you won't either, because you and I get a glimpse of Jesus, who not only expressed love to his neighbor, but also acknowledges their contribution, their value. And that's what people think about it. Consider how few people, how few of your neighbors are told, I see your value. I see your contribution. I see that you're making a difference. That's what Jesus does for all who make him their home. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for that example that you show us who would make our home not only love, unconditional love, but also value. That you see in us, even though you were, you were the king of the universe who does nothing wrong, who does everything perfectly right, you had people come alongside you and participate in your kingdom. Not only the 12, but others who sat around you by a fire. You said, these are my brothers and my sisters, my true family. They are valuable in my sight. Jesus, I pray for those who haven't made Jesus their true home, their true family. They would choose to do so today. And that we would all respond by communicating to others around us, not only unconditional love, but value during this Christmas season. And so people would see in us the attractiveness of Jesus. They would see in us a true Hallmark movie, a true story of love. In your name we pray. Amen.